Thank you. There was uh, Le Hato Soul Music. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sakile, and I'm your host uh, tonight. So I'll just take you through the program and just uh, tell you what, uh, what, what's going to happen. Um, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, the, we'll have two sessions, and, and this is a format that will, 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 will take place through, throughout the week. So what we have is you have the first session where you have two writers, and then we have a short interval of about 10 minutes, and then we come back and we have an, a, a second session, uh, which also um, constitutes of two writers, and, and then we go home. So I'm going to be very brief here. Um, but just to, 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 to begin with the, the first session, it's entitled um, New Voices from India, and you, it, the title just says, says it all. So it's, it's two writers from India, and they're going to be discussing whatever the topic is, and, uh, and, and we have an interval, as I said, and then the, sex the, 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 the second session. So the new voices from India, the two writers that would be uh, participating are pra Prajwal, uh, Parajuli, Parajuli, and Satyajit Sana, they both from India. The second session, uh, sorry, the first session will be facilita facilitated by uh, Shabnam Khan. Uh, the second session, which is entitled uh, Mzansi Women Voices, um, will have Angela Makolwa and uh, Prabha Mudli. So without uh, wasting time, let me just call uh, Prajwal and Satyajit uh, on stage to, to, to share with us uh, their books. Thank you. Hello everyone, can you all hear me? Okay, Hello. thank you for coming tonight. Welcome to the 17th time of the writer. I think we're kicking it off tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have two very young, very <coughs> new writers just published in the last two years here. Um, and sorry, my name is Shabnam. Um, and we'll be discussing new voices from India today. So I'm going to just um, briefly introduce them and then um, they'll read a little bit about, they'll read a little bit from their books so you have an idea of what their books are about. And then we'll start the discussion. So, Prajwal Parajuli is the son of an Indian father and a Nepalese mother. He um, worked as a marketer in New York, right? And then he um, went to study creative writing as a master's at Oxford. He travels between New York and London, and he often goes home to Gangtok, which is his hometown. Um, his first book of short stories was published in 2012, uh, The Gurkha's Daughter, and it was shortlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize in 2013, and he's releasing his next book, Land Where I Flee, this one, and it'll be launched tomorrow afternoon, um, I mean tomorrow evening actually, at 6.30 here at the time of the writer. So you guys should all be there. And then we have Satyajit Sarna, who is actually a lawyer. He studied at um, the National Law School in Bangalore. Uh, he's traveled a lot. His father is a diplomat, so he's lived in Poland, Iran, and um, the US. He's grown up there, but now he lives in New Delhi. He's got his own law firm. So he's a lawyer by day, but um, at night he dons his cape and turns into a writer. And um, his book is called The Angel's Share, and it was released by HarperCollins India last year. So, um, Satyajit, I think you can um, hit it off. Any um, excerpt that you want to share with the audience, and then we'll have Parajit. Yeah. Sure, thank you, Shabnam. Uh, I think Shabnam was too kind. Uh, it's not a law firm. It's the kind of law firm where you're the partner, the associate, and the T-boy. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so it's, uh, the, the book's called The Angel's Share, and... Um, I think just to give the audience a taste of what it's like, I'll just start at the beginning because um, it's, it's a good place. Um, <coughs> so the first chapter is called Imitation of Life. Um, after Sasha had died, the task of packing up his belongings was left to me. 
There wasn't much. I put his books and papers in his big black trunk and his clothes and sheets in two suitcases and handed them over to his parents. I kept one red shirt aside from Malaika, as I had promised, and swept the room out. Only one thing then remained, a pair of shin guards Sasha had left leaning against the railing to dry. Hard yellow plastic with the brand paint peeling off, the foam on the inside discolored with his sweat, a dead man's shin guards. Those I kept for myself as an inadvertent bequest. Sometimes, even now, I pull them out and look at them. Plastic is a sturdy thing. It does not rot or change. This is the truth we glean from archaeology, that our pots and pans and bangles and shin guards will outlive us all. More than anything, this is the story of Sasha Kapoor and his short and brave life. If there were a way to tell this story honestly, I'd barely show up. I'd skim around the edges like a fruit fly, landing briefly on the scene and then buzzing away. And even if I was witness only to a little of the story, a handful of years, I feel bound to give testimony because at times I was the sole witness. If anyone else decides that they too should speak, let them come forward and step in the box. Sure. I should, hmm? Did you want to um, read another excerpt? I could read another excerpt, but uh, shall we just take it up uh, as we go? Okay, Let's cool, fine. <laughs> so, okay, l let, me, uh, let me read you something else also. So that uh, ba basically the, the themes of the book uh, are basically loss and uh, loss, death, freedom, uh, you know, coming to terms with, with your life and its, its meaning. Um, but what I'm going to read you, because I think it's cute, is a little bit about uh, uh, someone who loves someone. Okay. <clears throat> now spring is here again. I wonder, is Jennifer walking trails with someone new? Is she on a beach, walking out of the sea, her skin encrusted with salt? Is she in a city, like me, ignoring the turning season? I remember one smell above all, a single nose tickle to designate the season. Spring is the smell of the bushes on the trail we once walked on the Western Ghats. On the curve of the hill, we stopped at some rocks covered with a spreading tree and took a nap that cost us an hour of daylight. An hour with her head in my lap, with the softness of the shawl her mother had given her under us, and the smell of her skin and the dry grass intermingling, each struggling to rise above the other, her skin winning ultimately as I, unfair referee, came closer to it. What skin it was, luminous, tight like a grape. When she opened her eyes, I wanted to shut them to make sure the light didn't leach out. That night, probably due to the hour of daylight we squandered, when the sun melted into a reduction of red paste across the ranges, we were still on the trail, with no sense of the distance we had ahead. We walked, though, because we knew there was no way to track back, till the road turned to path and the path to trail. Holding hands, Stumbling over roots in the dark, we came upon the stones of some dead civilization, an old temple in the dark, with moss on its large granite blocks, and behind it, a step well. Following the steps up from the well's black waters, up the curve of the hill, we found a trail leading up the slope, stepped from the same stone by the fiat of the rulers and the wisdom of their dead architects. We have history to spare in this country, we have history to burn and tear down in the name of gods and casuistry. And we have history to flog to foreigners. And when we're done with all that, we still have enough history to guide young lovers in the dark. Thank you, Sajidiv. <clears throat> um, Prajwal, do you want to? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, a Land Where I Flee is a family saga in which uh, four siblings living in various parts of the world convene in my hometown of Gangtok in the Indian Himalayas to celebrate their grandmother's 84th birthday. Uh, the grandmother is a little bit of a badass. 
She is not your average 84-year-old grandmother. Uh, she is a pretty formidable rival to have. All right, uh, I shall read an extract from uh, this book where one of the siblings, the first granddaughter in the family, ruminates about her life with a lower caste husband. You know, you can't write about India without writing about caste. That would be sacrilege, right? So, so um, she is an upper caste Brahmin woman married to a lower caste man. And the grandmother is not willing to accept that he is her grandson-in-law even after 18 years of marriage. How ironic it was that her husband, an untouchable, the lowest of the low castes, an upsetting byproduct of the heinous system that her ancestors helped create and propagate, should be so full of piety. He knew the shlokas, memorized elliptical Sanskrit mantras, read the Gita, and understood what festival was celebrated for what reason. He was combative when she, a Brahmin, dismissed Hinduism's many superstitions, made her analyze and reanalyze these beliefs, and furnished her with the scientific reasoning behind them, which she begrudgingly acknowledged. And yet, he could never become a priest. He would never be allowed near the altar of most Hindus. He was a casualty of Hinduism who had chosen not to be a victim. An untouchable who had no shame about his low caste as much as he did of robbing his Brahmin wife of hers on account of a marriage to him. A bigger Hindu, a better Hindu than she or anyone she knew. Ram Bahadur Damai, her husband, whose kind the Christian missionaries had been targeting for centuries and whose family had stood firm in their devotion to Hinduism, naming their child after a Hindu god. Ram Bahadur Damai, of the Taylor caste, the father of a half-caste children who would thankfully not be taunted in this country for carrying in the bloodline accusations of incest and consanguinity. Ram Bahadur Damai, responsible for the biggest blemish anyone had brought on a family, for belonging to a family of tailors, of alterers and cutters, for altering family dynamics in a way that could never be unaltered, for ripping grandmother from granddaughter in a way they could never be rehemmed. Ram Bahadur Damai, who gave her two sons in whose DNA were Damai blood and Brahmin blood, one infiltrating another, poisoning another, the two sons her grandmother would never touch, whose presence would desecrate her ancestral house. Ram Bahadur Damai, the untouchable kicked out of Bhutan, was a better human being than any of her family members would ever be. And as her husband stood in front of the makeshift altar, sonorously reciting the Gayatri Mantra, the Hanuman Chalisa, and the Ganesha Mantra, chants coined by the very Brahmins who had determined his legacy and the identity of his sons and grandsons, Bhagwati Nyopani Damai, with a bell oscillating in frenzy in one hand, prayed the hardest she had in her 37 years. For a long period, she had put off thinking about the enormity of the impending reunion, but it was here now. She would be seeing her grandmother after 18 years, for the first time since the elopement, and she needed to fortify herself with all the prayers of all the religions in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prajwa. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna start off with something quite simple. Um, first, this question is for both of you. Um, Prajwa, you were doing marketing before, right? And um, Satyajit, you were, well, you are a lawyer. Now, I'm interested in knowing why you got into writing and how you got into writing. 
I think that's something a lot of writers, wannabe writers out there want to know. How do you go from one career into writing? Uh, you know, as, as I said yesterday, writing just happened. I needed to legitimize my life somehow. I was working as an advertising executive at a paper called The Village Voice in New York. I quit, and uh, there were too many what are you doing with your life questions, so I, I started writing. When I wrote my collection of short stories, I had absolutely no idea about the world of publishing. I didn't know how the world of agenting worked. I knew nothing about imprints, and, uh, and I knew nothing about the stepdaughterly treatment meted out to short story collections in the Western market. I knew nothing. I thought, you know, I was very naive. I thought, okay, a short story collection should definitely be easier to write than a novel. So I started writing my first book called The Gurkha's Daughter. And uh, it was only after I started writing the novel that I realized how much easier writing the novel was compared to the collection of short stories. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'd evolved somewhat as a writer between the first book and the second book. That could have been the case. But writing the collection of short stories was a difficult, difficult job. And I'm extremely grateful for the naivety that, you know, that, that uh, permitted me to write the book because had I known what was out there, chances are I would have never attempted to write, and I would have needed another avenue to legitimize my existence. <laughs> yeah. You could have tried marriage. It sounds good in India. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, coming to that question, um, I, I don't know. I guess uh, uh, you, you don't think of writing as... Uh, I mean, well, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily think of writing as an, as an alternate profession. It's just something you you do because you know you're doing you're doing something and um, actually the first drafts of this book were written into uh, a Gmail inbox while I was at work. So you'd sit at work and something would come across your mind and you'd be like, "Damn, that sh that really should be written down somewhere." <laughs> and uh, so you know you'd go because you're not going to to do something else at work. You're not going to pull out some leather bound journal and you know sit down with an ink pen and whatever. <laughs> So you open up a, a draft mail, type it in, save it, let it go. And then after enough time, you have a bunch of draft mails and maybe you have a story. Um, but uh, that way, I, I mean, what I think is uh, that maybe I write because I want to leave something behind. And, um, and what I do is a great way to learn about the world. So, um, you know, I go to court every day, I stand in the back and I listen to people tell their stories. <laughs> and they're really interesting stories, you know, because um, they are full of conflict and it's naked, brutal conflict. Whether it's criminal or it's matrimonial or, you know, it's corporate or something. And there are all these people who are fighting each other tooth and nail and, you know, everything is coming out and these secrets are being exposed and, and it's, it's a great education. It's great education for writing. Mm. I always think journalists and lawyers make good writers because they get exposed to so much of stories. Um, but we're going to come to that this time. Um, OK, so the topic tonight is new voices from India. And um, I, really, I really like this idea, of, well, this idea of having this topic because I've noticed that there's a, there's a very different voice coming out of India recently. And, and so this is especially important um, because I'm speaking to both of you. Um, I find that a lot of publishers, especially in India, I found are willing to take on young writers and take on new voices, which um, is not common. It's not the tra traditional writers. And um, I also feel like there's a move away from um, the migrant experience and the clash of the cultures and um, the conflict of assimilation in a new society. I, I, I definitely feel there's a move away from that. Um, and I do feel like the allure of Indian writing is that. Okay, um, just, just hang in with me, yeah, I'm getting to the question. So, um, and it seems like the, the popular topics of Indian tradition versus modernity now seems sort of like passe or hashed out. And um, I know you've mentioned as well that, you, that you've, you've talked about caste in your book, but even then, that's not the focus in the book. That's just something thrown in the side as compared to, I feel, 
all the books where the issue was caste, the issue was being a traditional person in a modern society. And now it seems to me that the books nowadays that I read from India are not about that. That's by the way, if you have a Indian traditional woman living in London, so what? She's, you know, we've had that story, we've heard that story before. We want to deal with the issues that we're dealing with now. What are the issues we're dealing with now? So I definitely feel there's like a strong, um, young, modern voice cutting through the Indian landscape. And um, I'm interested in knowing what that means for um, Indian literature. Where, where do you think that's going? What does it do for Indian literature? <laughs> okay, I, I want to recharacterize your, uh, your initial depiction of... And, and, if, and if you think I'm <laughs> going wrong anywhere. You mean no, no, it, yeah. I think you've got onto something really valuable. Because, um, say, Indian writing in English, as it were, uh, you know, we measure it from maybe Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children or somewhere in the early 80s or, or something. And the problem is, all the time I was growing up, Indian writers in English were writing for somebody else. They were writing for a Western audience, they were writing for a world audience. And they were, they were out there like, you know, some kind of diplomat with their passport saying, listen to me, I'm an Indian. Let me prove how Indian I am to you. You know, uh, and the way I see it is this is like the mango question. So all of these books, they're full of these descriptions of mangoes. <laughs> and, and like, if you want to look for, you know, uh, a, a marker of Indianness, Sherche la mango, you know, <laughs> so, so to speak, because, uh, you know, they're like sensuous and they're Eastern and they're mysterious and they're so sweet. <laughs> what are they even like, you know? So all of those books about mangoes, literally you could just go and in the first five pages you'll find a mango. You know, and I'm really happy we've stopped writing books about mangoes because everyone knows what a mango is like. You know, uh, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, you think Indian writing in English, and until very, very recently, it was either mangoes or flying maharajas or beautifully woven carpets or, or something. Yeah. And... Uh, that has changed. It's, it's changing. And it's a very, very exciting time to be a writer in India. Uh, you know, we, we may be very well-known Indian writers, but there are people out there who are writing the nastiest claptrap about, about getting into prestigious engineering institutes, who are writing ridiculous love stories, who are selling books by the hundreds of thousands, and, uh, I mean, you sit and stare and, you know, you, you talk about them, you talk about how awful they are, you feel jealous about how popular they are, especially in the heartland. But um, it is, it's an exciting time. All these international publishing houses are establishing Indian branches. Simon & Schuster, Bloomsbury, uh, Penguin Random House has been there for a long time. HarperCollins, I mean, we, you know, people are establishing, their, uh, these international publishing houses are starting in India. Why? Because we now have the third highest English reading population in the world. And, and it's, it's bound to increase and improve because a hallmark of, of class mobility in India is speaking and reading in English. And one way of showing the world that you've made it is by picking up a ridiculous Chetan Bhagat book and reading it mm. on the train, uh, which is what is happening. Mm -mm. That being said, I still maintain that it is an exciting time to be a writer in India. You go to the West and you're happy you sell 3,000 copies of your book. You go to India and you're selling 10 to 20,000 copies of your book, which is, which is lovely. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just checking which, okay, how much time, right. So, um, Satyajit, we've, we met, we've mentioned briefly that being a lawyer sort of informs your work and um, sort of drives you to find stories or exposes you to these stories as well. I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about that process. Um, actually, probably the, the most useful thing I could do is read an excerpt, but I think it would be an excerpt in two voices because uh, one of the scenes in that book um, is the cross-examination of a rape victim, which is pretty much one of the nastiest things you'll ever mm. see in a court, mm. Mm. you know? Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's that kind of thing, as in, is, is that what you're looking for? As in, you're looking to, yeah, to well, see how... Yeah, well, when I read that scene, I, I, I thought, well, that's, that's probably how you would see it when you're sitting there in the court, and it's exactly this, it's this 
uncomfortable. Yeah. It made me very uncomfortable that scene. Just watching a young woman. Um, maybe you can tell them a little bit more about it. Uh, yeah. So basically, if you're, you know, if you're the counsel for the defendant, in uh, you know, um, sort of in a in a rape case, and you're you're basically you know with the the accused, right? Uh, it's pretty much your job to try to get them off. How do you do that? You try to prove that the victim was either, you know, um, lying, making it up, asking for it, whatever, whatever, promiscuous you know, also. promiscuous, what, whatever you can, whatever you can. And even though there, there's specifically law against that, you know, against that going anywhere, it's still something which happens. And I mean, as a society, we, we, we're facing all these questions of, of gender violence, of all of those things. And you know, the, the problem is, the, the way you, I see it, at least technically, and I, I sometimes hate myself for seeing it technically, um, is that it's a very delicate, fine balance uh, between preserving people's rights and other people's rights. And you know, sometimes I think about it and I think that maybe a bunch of top-hatted Englishmen in the 19th century actually got it right. And that worries me. Okay, I'm still speaking about women. Prajwal, you write a lot about um, women in your first um, set of short stories, The Gorka's Daughter and Now in Land Where I Flee. Um, I've noticed very strong women characters and I'm always interested in that because I write a lot about women as well. Um, why, why do you think you empathize so much with women in your stories? Or why do, they, why do you have such a strong focus on them? Is it intentional or just completely? Oh, well, I, I like to believe I understand women pretty well. I also <laughs> like to believe I understand men okay well, but uh, it's, it's always more fun to write women characters. I've realized, you know, layered women characters are a lot more fun to write than ma male characters. And uh, I am also sick and tired of that stereotypical octogenarian Indian woman who falls to her husband's feet and then cries at the drop of a hat, being written about in books like there's no tomorrow. So, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I decided to write strong women characters into my book, and it's fun. The interesting thing is the strongest woman character, I think, in your book is actually a man. Or am I giving away? Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. See, when but, I set out... I like out, that there's a, there's a play that you... you yeah. Yeah, no. When, when I set out to write, I don't know. I, I think of a certain character and then these uh, especially female characters sprout wings of their own and become their own people. And, I mean, if they want to emerge as strong characters from out of the book, I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we were having an interesting discussion this afternoon about Indian politics, and we thought it would be nice to share a little bit of what we were discussing um, with you, with the audience. Um, there's a section in Satyajit's book um, about the Bombay terror attacks, um, which I, I don't think we have time for, for reading about that, but I'll just um, pre briefly get into this discussion that we were having. Um, and we found that South Africa and India have very similar, they're in very similar places right now. Um, we're both facing our elections coming up. Um, nobody's really sure of who to vote for. Um, you've got the very fanatical um, <laughs> groups. And um, what also it means if certain uh, parties get into power, what it means for um, certain minorities in the country. And um, so I know this is, a, this is a pretty big topic and you can jump in where you feel comfortable. Um, but as the young new voices in, 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 in India, I'm interested in hearing where you think um, India is heading politically. Um, I've always wanted uh, to move to India. This is sort of like my dream, I moved to India. But politically, I was always a bit uneasy because I don't know where India is going in which direction. It's becoming increasingly militant, I feel. Certain new laws, you'd be able to tell me more about this. Certain new laws um, that have made me a little more uncomfortable. and. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's changing. The, the landscape is, I mean, physically the landscape is changing. I hear people saying all the time India is growing, it's booming. But I think politically also it's going in a certain direction. And any discussion that you want to have about this, um, where, where you think what's happening now with the elections? Um, Jump well, in anyway. What I'm seeing is, uh, you know, definitely an... Uh, the, the problem is that there's been this, this really stagnant, uh, centrist uh, government which 
in power for the last at least 10 years and people basically don't even remember what they used to stand for if they ever stood for anything. So, uh, you know, and, and like whatever, politics abhors a vacuum. So um, what that, that negative space is being taken up by, as far as I can tell from what I see, you know, and maybe it's just eyewitness evidence, who knows what is going on in that big, hulking, massive country full of, you know, millions of people, who knows what they're thinking, because I certainly can't say I do. But I'm definitely seeing a strong move towards the right. And uh, it concerns me. It concerns me. It means less freedom for, um, it means less freedom for minorities, I suspect. It definitely means less freedom for expression. It means less freedom for uh, contentious personal rights, um, you know, say consensual homosexuality, uh, for example, which we discussed yesterday. Um, and so I'm concerned about that. Just recently, I, I think it was quite a, quite a big political football also. Um, this uh, book about Hinduism got banned. Mm, mm. I mean, not, not banned in a, in a sense through government action, but basically pulped because a publishing company could not put up with the risk of continuous litigation uh, by right-wing groups. And that was, that was just something that, you know, definitely sent a shiver down my spine as someone who likes to write books and would not want to watch what I have to say on paper. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's where I'm concerned. What, I mean, that, that's pretty much what I see as a, as a trend. You know, it makes me very, very nervous. It really does. We have uh, the forerunners for the position of prime minister are A, the scion of the Gandhi Nehru family, Rahul Gandhi, who has the smartness of a box of pubic hair, and, uh, and B, Narendra Modi, who supposedly has Hitler's morals and, uh, you know, is, is allegedly responsible for uh, ethnic cleansing in, in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who do you vote for? Seriously, there's no choice here. I'm hoping a third person comes up. Maybe you should run for election or something. <laughs> I mean, no, you, you would definitely make a better candidate than you've, the two you've, of us. You've left out the, yeah. the prominent third uh, party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Your party. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about that Amadmi party? Yeah, yeah, thought, yeah. I we've think got the, <laughs> the EFP equivalent of India. Yeah, the EFP yeah, the equivalent. The common yeah. man's party and... Uh, you would know more about him than I. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know, do a lot of people here understand Hindi? Okay, I'll... Uh, <laughs> Nick <laughs> understands Hindi. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, there's, this, there's, this popular, uh, there's this popular thing doing the rounds. Um, it's just a couplet. And it goes, um, Sabke man mein ek sawal, Modi, Baba, Kejdiwal. Yeah? And sabko mera ek jawab. Katil, bevakuf, dimag kharap. So those are pretty much the choices that, uh, you know, uh, people are left with. An idiot, a murderer, and someone absolutely insane. <laughs> So. Yeah, you see, that's why I said South Africa and India are facing the same, similar, similar problems. Is it that bad, really? <laughs> is, is it that bad? Well, Choices I don't are limited. Know. Maybe, Choices maybe are limited. You guys should run for pres presidency. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some, some writer from the audience. Nick, yeah. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go quickly for one question and then we can take a few questions from the crowd. Um, so, both your books are based a little on, or a lot on, um, the kind of histories that you've had. So, Prajwal, you've grown up in Sikkim. Um, Satyajit, you, you've been at a law, college, um, law university studying with other students as well. And um, I'm interested in knowing where history and, um, well, where the story becomes your own, actually, where the characters become your own. Um, you always have thought of the first novel, people say it's autobiographical, but I do know from my own experience writing that a novel becomes your own at some point and you make these people your own. But I'm interested in knowing at which point this happens or how does this happen and how can you then say, this is, it's based, it has a history, but it's my own story. Uh, I, I have come across so many people who say that first novels are always autobiographical. I, 
I think it's absolute nonsense. I do. I mean, I lead such a humdrum, monotonous existence that it would translate into the most boring novel on earth. Between, I mean, between going through New York and London and Oxford. Well, well, and what? I mean, going through New York and sleeping for 12 hours a day. All I do is write, sleep, Google myself half a dozen times a day. <laughs> write, sleep, Google myself half a dozen times a day. So, I mean, that's, that's all I do. It, it definitely doesn't translate. It, it won't translate into a good, good novel at all. But... Uh, Yes, a lot of the aspects of both my books may be stolen from the experiences of people around me, may be borrowed from the experiences of people around me. Some are figments of my imagination. I, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you, you write about what you're surrounded by. You write about uh, uh, what you see many times, unless you're writing Lord of the Rings or something. Uh, uh, yeah, and... Uh, you know, I, I often, uh, I don't know if I'm rambling here, am I? I? I don't know. Anyway, yeah, yeah, so, so, so that's there. Yes, okay. that did you. <laughs> Help me out. It's, uh, well, it's a bit more conflicted for me because, like, and I usually hide behind the fact that it says fiction on the back, but that's not entirely true. I know because I've borrowed uh, stuff that definitely happened to people I know, happened to me. Um, but something really weird happens, like Brajwal was saying. Uh, about how real life is boring. Real people are boring. Like you cannot put them on in, into three pages and expect them to make sense. You have to know them for years before they, you know, they make sense. And something happens in that process where you take, say, your friend, and then you, know, you take them and then they become this, this puppet, this marionette, mm. and you, know, you sort of have to break their legs and you have to remove their freedom of motion, and then you finally get to do what you want with them and make them go to such and such place and make them say such and such thing. And at that point, that's when you're writing fiction. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's a nice metaphor. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're going to take, I think, probably like two or three questions from the audience, if there are any. So just raise your hand and I think a mic will come to you. You have two amazing authors from India here. <laughs> Prajwal said, take advantage of him, exploit him, ask him questions. Yes, well, this is what he said yesterday. So. Namaste to both of you. <laughs> the question is uh, to both of you again. Uh, as an educator, we found that in South Africa, uh, readership is dying. Very few people are actually reading newspapers, textbooks, novels, whatever. When, when you as, a, uh, as an author are writing, are you, are you concerned at the fact that, that no one might, no, might actually read your book? <laughs> Desperately concerned. <laughs> but um, you know there are always going to be readers. There are always going to be readers. And I'm just thinking of this one uh, analogy a writer of, of you know, I, I like to read, uh, used in, in a book, and she said that when she could find nothing else in her apartment because she was moving, and so all the books were in boxes, she read the manual to a Toyota Corolla three times over. <laughs> you know, and there are always going to be people who enjoy text, image, whatever, and those forms will change. The novel is going to change. Uh, I think we are seeing that before our eyes. In 10 years, I don't know if there is going to be a strong market for 60,000 words. Mm. Like 60 to 100 or whatever, you know, those lovely editors at your publishing house will ask you to do. Um, but I do also think that we're entering what, is, what looks like a golden age of, of uh, long-form writing. So in that 10,000 to 15,000 word range, I mean, the, the stuff you see on on the internet, the stuff you see in magazines. Uh, these, these things are amazing, you know? So those forms are changing. I'm, and I'm sure they will, they have to. Uh, no one writes, you know, poems that are sestinas and sonnets and stuff, uh, you know, anymore. It's, it, it doesn't, it's not relevant. Uh, in the same way, this, this stuff has to change as well. 
Uh, you know, the publishing world is changing at such a rapid pace that one doesn't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. Chances are, you, 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 and all of us will be writing for the one publishing house called Penguin, Random House, Hopper Collins, Simon Schuster, Hachette, and dot, 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 dot. Uh, you know, given the, the rate at which all these publishing houses are merging, uh, you, you never know. Uh, I also think that... Uh, Okay, I lost my train of thoughts. Uh, you know, I also think that the long form might be making a resurgence. Uh, you know, because we often say things like, oh, the short story is dead. Oh, uh, no one buys short stories. And then we say, but people are so busy. Why write long books? Why don't you write short books? And then publishers say, no one buys short story collections. So there are all these contradicting thoughts out there in the marketplace which is exciting. It means no one knows what the hell is happening. And no one knows what's happening, seriously. I mean, all we know is that Amazon is out there to drive independent bookstores out of business, uh, to, to do a number of evil things. And you know what? I change back what I, I change what I said. Uh, I take back what I said. You know, we may be just be writing for the one publishing house called Amazon in 10 or 15 years from now. And there is not much we can do about it. So buy as many books as you can, because 15 years from now, I mean, we may only be reading on e-books and, you know, what are these books called? Paper books? Hard copies? Hard, uh, hard, yeah. Okay, well, well yeah, you know, yeah, may just be non-existent. You never know, which is pretty so sad. Alternately, alternately, and I just, yeah. I'm sorry, Shabnam, but uh, I just want to throw the possibility out there that, and it's a really an exciting possibility, that maybe we won't have to stand in line and wait on people who are allegedly more educated than us to edit and publish and do other stuff, maybe we can finally, you know, um, and increasingly people are e-publishing directly and some of those things sink and some of them float and some of them fly. And what about quality control then? That's what the market's there for. Okay. You're, you're not going to read crap. You're not going to read it, but... Um, mm -hmm. Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. You win. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Um, there's one there. Um, so your new voice is from India. <laughs> um, do you see yourselves as uh, intrinsically Indian voices or world writers working, writing about world topics for a world audience who happen to have your roots and culture in India? One of you lives in Oxford, so it's actually a new voice from Oxford in some sense. <laughs> <laughs> or London, or I don't know, London, New York. So, anyway, so um, that, that's my question. Do you, how how do you see see yourselves as a kind of intrinsic voice of Indianness, or simply world writers for a world audience? Uh, I I I see myself as a writer. I mean, right now I write about the Nepali-speaking Indian world, but I'm quickly tiring of it and might be a children's writer tomorrow or something. Oh, I also think that as a person who writes for an international audience, whether or not I like to admit it, I am pandering to the Western reader. Uh, you know, there is a, all the self-righteousness in my part of the world about not not writing for the Western reader. Oh, I'm writing for myself, which I think is um, absolute hogwash because, I mean, if you're writing for yourself, why do you get published at all? Uh, 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 was, that, was that your question? I, did I answer your question in a roundabout way? Yeah. Okay. All right. Satyajit? Um, I think it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, you put it that way. So what is writing for India then? Because that's the inverse question that you're asking. Um, and then the, the question would be, uh, what do I do? Do I talk about mangoes? Do I not talk about mangoes? <laughs> and, um, and, and the thing is, because, you know, because we're writing in English, and you know, for so long it's been a one-way street, and you know, we're used to receiving. And so you're used to receiving, and you're used to reading about stuff like when I was, whatever, a kid. I read a lot of books by Enid Blyton, and they keep eating food that I, I could not figure out, you know, what the hell is a grumpet? And, uh, you know, and maybe 
there's no there's really no distinction between who you're writing for because once that 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 book is out there assuming it's world rights or whatever assuming it goes to bookshops assuming it has a market fine those are prosaic assumptions those are prosaic concerns but i don't see why whatever language you speak whether it's isizulu or it's hindi or whatever why those words can't go back up that stream and force other people to find a glossary find a dictionary you know google something and find out what people mean by you know something like i was reading prajwal's uh, book like amita pan you know someone needs to learn that that's fine they'll want to ideally you know this this question of who do you write for can i think screw a writer up in many many ways because you don't know whether to contextualize something. You're afraid that if you contextualize a Nepali word too much, it's going to alienate your South Asian reader. Whereas if you do not contextualize it at all, you're afraid that the Western reader is going to be at sea. So you just don't think about it and do whatever the hell you want and hope that people who understand it, who read it will understand it or Google it or something. Yeah. yeah. They're smarter than you think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think just also to add light to that question also, um, I remember at a festival they asked Ben Okri whether he was an African writer or a writer, very similar to your question, and he said um, there are two types of writers, good writers and bad writers. And I think on that note, we are going to end the hey. session. Thank you very much, and um, mm -hmm. enjoy the rest yeah. of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you guys. Uh,